Now we're going to have Paul Blazucci with uh, Active Patterns in F Sharp. All right, welcome, welcome. Uh, so I know I'm, I'm standing between everyone and afternoon beers or coffee or whatever people are doing post-conference, so I'll try not to drag on too long or ramble too much. Uh, quick show of hands, so it'll help me. How many people here uh, do any work with or are familiar with F-sharp? All right, good, that's good. How many people here, are, I'm assuming everyone here is more generally familiar with MLs in general, so I can sort of breeze through the whole bit on pattern matching. Are all comfortable with that one? Okay, if, if you do have burning questions about pattern matching, it's okay. Uh, last question, how many people here are familiar with uh, .NET or Mono, basically the CLR, C Sharp, that whole stack for doing things? All right, good, awesome. So we're gonna dig in, we're gonna talk about nearly everything you ever wanted to know about active patterns, but we're afraid to ask. Uh, my name, uh, like Ryan said, is Paul Blazucci. I'm a senior software engineer at Quicken Loans, uh, where we do actually use some F Sharp in some of our systems though not all of them because that would be too cool. Um, I'm gonna put one disclaimer. This talk is about a feature of F Sharp that is awesome, but only in so much as it helps with subjective aspects of code. It helps with the readability of code. It helps with the maintainability of code. We're gonna be talking about very subjective things here. We're not gonna be talking about something where you can take it, look at what it does and say, oh my God, this is this thing that could only be accomplished this way and it's amazing and you know, so I'm gonna just right off the bat preempt any, well, couldn't you just do this, this, and this kind of questions? Because we're not talking about distinctive features today. We're talking about making the code more readable making, expressing your ideas more clearly, and about the fact that we work in higher level languages because we're, we're writing code for humans, not for computers. If we truly wanted to write code for computers, we would just use assembler and that would be fine. Um, so the overall hypothesis of this talk is that in so much as they expand the reach of pattern matching, active patterns improve the readability of code. Now, briefly, pattern matching is amazing. It's an ML conference. Everybody's here familiar with pattern matching in, in various languages, ML or otherwise. There are rules for transforming data. And, ooh, my slides are getting a little clipped here. That's weird. Um, interesting. Okay, this is sort of interesting. Uh, there's supposed to be some more code up here, but we'll blow through that pretty quickly. Uh, generally speaking, pattern matching in F sharp, you've got a match statement and a with uh, keyword and then a bunch of options and the value in between the match and the width gets matched, and the first one that matches goes. Pretty straightforward, very similar. You also have pattern matching used for data decomposition, so if I want to pull values out of some structured data type, like a record or a tuple, I can do that right in sort of my binding statements where I bind my values uh, into named identifiers. You can also do that as you pass arguments into the definitions of functions. Um, this will be very familiar to people who work in OCaml or Haskell or Erlang or, or even Prolog. So I'm not gonna spend a ton of time on it. You could see here we're doing a little fizz buzz, but uh, whatever. So but pattern matching, especially in F Sharp, has some limitations. It has some very real limitations. Because F Sharp runs on top of the CLR, the CLR was not originally built with any ML in mind. It wasn't built with any functional programming language in mind. A lot of the decisions in the CLR are very much geared towards C sharp and things that are of a very uh, Pascal, Algol, C sort of a bend. So there's a lot of places where C sharp or F sharp can't do sort of intelligent pattern matching. It doesn't know how to intelligently pattern match over very complex OO style class hierarchies. It doesn't know how to dig into individual properties of individual object types. Uh, in fact, there are there are 16 distinct patterns that F -sharp, the F -sharp compiler knows how to decompose a pattern match statement into, knows how to work with, and they cover a lot of things. These are all things you, you're pretty comfortable with in, in functional programming, in, in ML languages, uh, checking identifiers, checking tuples, binding to constants, binding to uh, lists and decomposing lists and so on and so forth. But you have things like this glorious beast of code here where this is, not great, but actually legit 
code for working with the CLR's reflective metaprogramming system, you'll get a, a instance of a class called type that gives you the type information for your code. And you can't pattern match on it. So what we have is this messy blob of if, elif, else, elif, nonsense with these nested ifs. And it's, it's ugly. It's, there are limitations. We can't make this look better. But we can. On around 2007, uh, Don Syme, the, the inventor of the F-sharp language with a couple of other very smart gentlemen, released a very interesting paper at ICFP uh, where they debuted active patterns, which make pattern matching powerful and flexible, as they say. What it really does is it gives you, the developer, an extension point where you can increase the amount of pattern matching knowledge that the compiler has. So for people who don't know, because I found this shocking or surprising when I first discovered it many years ago, when the compiler encounters a pattern match, it just turns it into some simpler, more fundamental statement, like an if statement or a select statement or what have you. Um, active patterns let you extend that process. They let you make the compiler smarter so now it can match more types of things. It can match things more intelligently. Uh, and active patterns can be used in any pattern expression, and they can be defined to operate on any type. In many cases, they can be checked statically for completeness and redundancy. Uh, they are subject to a lot of the same properties as functions, as first class functions. So there's lots of cool things you can do with them there. And so we're going to dig into some of what this looks like. Now, fundamentally, there are, uh, depending on how, how you want to classify it, four or so different sort of kinds of active patterns. The first and simplest is what's known as a single case total pattern. And uh, the fact that it's total should clue you in on some cases where you might use it. You want to use it when you're looking at a domain in a total functional sense, meaning you are 100% sure of the inputs and outputs going on with a particular function. You have complete understanding of the values present in a domain. And what this does is it provides an alternate view on your data, and I'm going to use view very, very generally here and not to mean any, any specific concept from any you know, PL theory research. More like a view in a relational database management system. It doesn't change the underlying data, but it shapes the way you look at it. And what we do is we have this banana clip syntax with a parentheses and a pipe. We have an identifier in between them, and we have the type we're matching against as an argument. And what this will do is this will take, in the case here of the complex type, it'll take the real and imaginary values out and pair them with an identifier called rect, which if we look down at the bottom to our, our, our sorry, to we down to our add statement, we have a match where we're taking in two complex numbers, but we're shaping them into rectangular coordinates to work on adding them. So this rect uh, identifier gets added into the available match identifiers in the uh, global space of program execution. And it lets you clean, make your code a bit more readable, a bit more um, general. What's nice is we can do the same thing for polar. Uh, and now we're looking with you know, phase and magnitude. And our underlying complex value hasn't changed. We don't touch that. We're just providing a different way of looking at it. Um, that can be really interesting. That can let you look at your data in different ways. That can let you carve things up in different ways. Now, in the wild, truthfully, single case total patterns don't come up all that often. They're of somewhat limited use, uh, but they do come up every now and again. We'll see one reasonably good example a little later on in the talk, but that's the general concept. The next one is sort of the next logical extension, a multi-case total pattern. Now, these are very common, very interesting, and very useful. Uh, much like a single case total pattern, these, uh, these active patterns have identity and they can be checked for exhaustivity. So the compiler will tell you if you're matching against it and you don't have all of your cases covered. Tremendously useful. Uh, a multi-case total pattern really takes a value and puts it into one of several buckets. Um, you're not really limited. I mean, you are sort of limited. The limit is seven. But um, if you need more than seven buckets, you might want to rethink how you're working with your data model. But the point is here, we're using four buckets. We take a number, and we're doing fizzbuzz again. And we're classifying the number into a bucket. What's nice is now, 
we match our, our integer, our in32 actually, down here at the bottom, and we get this nice, clean, readable, oh, it's fizzbuzz, or it's fizz, or it's buzz. So again, are we doing something that's radically unexpressible otherwise? No, but we are improving the readability, the declarative nature, and as we'll see in some other examples a little bit later on, it lets us address some of the shortcomings, particularly when we work with uh, other CLR types that are not F-sharp friendly, things that come from C-sharp, that come from VB, that come from C++ CLI, that are not designed with sort of these ML-style semantics in mind. So um, another thing about multi-case total patterns, they are perfect for when you want the semantics or the feel of an algebraic data type, but either don't want to define one for some reason, or in many cases can't define one because you're not working with types that you control. Now you could define an actual, uh, you know, uh, abstract data type, or sorry, algebraic data type to wrap some value, but it's very often just easier to uh, use an active pattern. So, in fact, I very often will use active patterns when I work with libraries where I don't like the shape of a particular union that they have come up with. I want to tweak it to look more the way I think it should. Boom, active pattern, reasonably lightweight way to accomplish that, especially when they don't like your pull requests. Anyway, so moving on, we've seen total patterns, now we have partial patterns. Partial patterns are partial in that they represent some subset of, uh, of the values in a domain. They don't have identity and they are not checked for exhaustivity. Uh, in fact, as you'll see from this example here, they have a mapping onto options, which I'll translate for the Haskell crowd, maybe. <laughs> Come on, everybody else agreed on option. Um, so uh, what we do is we take in, we again have our banana clip, our, our funny identifier with our bracket, or sorry, our parentheses and our pipe. We have this underscore here, which uh, is your indication that it's a partial pattern, that it's not going to return you a distinctive value for every input that you give it. And what we do is we do our matching, and whatever expressions, whatever logic we have inside of our active pattern, we have to return either sum or none, where sum represents a valid partial match, and none represents, oh, guess what? We're in the, the unknown part. Um, here again, we are doing fizzbuzz, because why not? We've now defined fizz and buzz as discrete partial patterns. What's interesting is we use them down here in our match statement. We can match distinctly on n. We can match on fizz or on buzz. We can switch from doing an alternation match, you know, with a pipe, to doing a, a conjunctive match with an and sign. And this will require, this will check for i matching both fizz and buzz. So this is a nice thing in pattern matching that you don't really see in a lot of other uh, languages that support pattern matching. And that's the idea that your matches can be exclusive or inclusive, and that opens up some very interesting scenarios. And that's, um, and that's true of um, matching That is correct. Um, the, the, the conjunctive matching was added to F -sharp specifically because of its utility with active patterns, but it is usable outside of active patterns. It's just they didn't really realize they had a need for it until they started playing around with putting active patterns in. Um, the underscores are just because, you know, uh, patterns can return values, they don't have to. In this case, they return the original value that was passed in, but we're ignoring it. Obviously, you can return any value. Um, these are very good for very application-specific focused views of data where you know it's not every possible value, you only want the values you care about. There are some very interesting examples out in the wild of using this technique to make parsing uh, you know, textual input uh, read a lot better, um, and there are some other cool ones we'll see as we go on. Uh, the, le the next thing we want to look at is parameterized patterns, and you know, we're going to get away from, from uh, fizzbuzz for a minute and instead look at uh, regular expressions. Now, for people who have worked with .NET, regardless of the language, you'll feel me on this one, the .NET regex API is awful, 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 awful. It's almost, but not quite as bad as the reflective metaprogramming APIs. Fortunately, active patterns are awesome for turning ugly APIs into something that is actually pleasant to use, or less terrible anyway. And so here, we have a partial active pattern that has multiple inputs now. And what it's doing is 
the very last input to an active pattern will be the value that you match against. The one plus parameters that come before it are just additional inputs that let you fine tune the behavior of the pattern. In this case, we've got a groups active pattern that will try to match a string against a regex. The actual regex it matches against will pass in as an argument. And then it will perform the regexiness and either return a list of the named groups inside that, inside that regex, or it will return none. And so here we use it, we take the, uh, the string 37206, we match it against our active pattern, passing in the regex we want to match with, in this case trying to pull out the five digit and four digit components of a zip code, I think, uh, and then we bind that to our list of named groups, where, and we pull out, you know, just the, the five digit part. Uh, and then we print out the postal code. Uh, obviously the underscores for the case where we didn't match groups, so life goes on. Um, questions so far? Yeah, on your previous slide? Sure. That last pattern match where it has in and then print yes. and uh, a in. Yes. What is, what, is that, like, what is the type of in and what would that actually print out? Okay, so the type of n here is the same as i. So that's just, at this point, we're just taking the matched value and binding it to a different identifier. We could have easily, re in, in most cases, I probably would have rebound it to i and just shadowed it because whatever. This printf, uh, printf n percent a n is going to print out n and it's going to automatically, like F sharp has some built-in smarts for automatically knowing how to print out primitive types, and that's what percent %a is doing. But I could have easily put printfn percent %a i there and would have gotten the exact same output. It's just going to print the number in string form. Okay. So uh, pretty straightforward stuff. I just chose to rebind it there. Uh, back to here. I want to stress for parameterized patterns, there's no limit to the number of parameters you can pass in. Uh, but the caveat is parameterized patterns must be partial. You cannot parameterize a total pattern. And that has to do with uh, completeness checks at evaluation time and such. Um, the paper does go into all that in, in terrific detail, and it's actually quite an approachable paper. Um, so the last thing that's cool about active patterns is, is their first class. Um, you know, you can do all of the things you would normally do with functions. You can compose them. You can partially apply them. You can treat them as arguments into other functions. You could, I suppose, in theory, return them from other functions, but I've never seen an actual usage of that in the wild. Um, they can be fully nested and combined to do very complex things. This example is sort of very interesting. So we have a basic uh, you know, tree where we've got a leaf node that carries some data or a branch that has you know, two additional trees. Um, we create a partial active pattern called branch that if it is a branch rather than a leaf, will return you the two sub-branches of that branch. Uh, obviously, if it's a leaf, it doesn't match. We then define this collection function, which is a higher order function. What's interesting about this is we've got something that sort of looks like an active pattern in the, um, in the function definition itself. And what we're doing here is we're saying, we're not defining pred as an actual active pattern. We're defining a placeholder that says, any active pattern that has this same signature, we can use in this function call. And what we will do, what that'll do, is it will pull out two values, and we will use them to continue our loop and accumulate up our list. We then create a total, single case total pattern at the bottom here called branches, which takes in the root of our tree and uses collect plus the branch active pattern to collect up all of the values out of the branches, ignoring the leaves. So that's sort of interesting. We've got an active pattern, and then we've got the ability to use it as a secondary input to a higher order function, which is kind of cool. Uh, questions about this? Yeah. Uh, I'm actually wondering what the type, uh, the type, the, the printed type of the collect function there is. The printed type of the collect function yeah. will, uh, the, the, how do I put this? So root will obviously be of type tree of t, uh, and the pred active pattern will actually look like a function signature. It will look as though you're passing in uh, a function. So it'll have a signature of uh, tree, you know, tree prime t uh, arrow uh, 
and then uh, an option of tree prime t star, you know, uh, tree prime t. So can you combine this with, with more complex things like uh, multi-case total patterns? Absolutely. You do have to be careful about how you combine patterns. Um, in this particular case, a multi-case total pattern wouldn't match this signature. Um, but you could use the same technique with a multi-case total pattern. Uh, this particular signature, it's looking for something that's returning a partial pattern. It's looking for partial values. So the signature of pred, when you look at it, is going to require that the output be an option of a tuple. Um, but the technique is generally applicable. And in gen oh yeah, sorry, go ahead. Uh, I was going to say, generally, when you work with multi-case total patterns, they tend to be the only thing in your match. When you're working with single case total patterns or partial patterns, that's when you tend to combine different active patterns into the same matching. So that's just sort of the way it works. Um, I noticed that uh, you have a branch that mm -hmm. both the name of an active pattern and the constructor of the type tree. Yes. So active patterns live in a distinct namespace? Uh, not so much in a namespace per se, but from the compiler standpoint, it holds separately a list of these are active pattern identifiers. These are identifier, you know, case constructors from an actual DU. Like the compiler knows there's a difference between them. Uh, there's not sort of a, a distinctive from a .NET standpoint, .NET namespace that you can access to get at them. Um, but uh, they, in fact, they are namespaced along with regular namespacing rules for .NET. So uh, standard modules functions just like anything else in F Sharp. But yeah, the, the compiler has additional metadata where it knows, oh, this, much, this must be an active pattern versus this must be a case constructor. And if you think about the type signatures involved, which we're actually going to go look at it in a minute, it makes sense because a partial active pattern is always going to have as its output an option, whereas a case constructor is always going to have as its output the type of the union being constructed. So you disambiguate which to use in this case. Uh, like if I said match uh, something with branch, I'd be able to disambiguate which one I mean by whether it whether I can infer it returns sum or something else? Correct. And in the case of the higher order function with pred, because we're specifically declaring pred that way, we're saying, look, it needs to be of the active pattern shape, which it's going to go ahead and disambiguate based on the return type. Um, so. so what does that actually, that leads us, that's a great segue into our next bit, is what does this look like when we actually desugar? So before we, well, yeah, okay, let's go look at what it looks like when we actually do sugar, and then we'll go look at a bunch of actual examples of, of playing around with this some more. So we've got our four basic types of patterns, our single case total, our multi-case total, our partial, our, our parameterized. Uh, this is the standard sort of shorthand notation for the format. And if you've got a single case total pattern, it really just maps from the input, a function of the input to the output. If you've got a multi-case total pattern, it maps from the input to a choice. Uh, choice in F Sharp is sort of like either in Haskell, except that it's not limited to two. There are overloads for three, four, five, six, seven. So based on the number of cases in your multi-case definition, you will map your output to the appropriate choice type with the appropriate arity there. So a choice of two, a choice of three, a choice of seven, what have you. So that's a pretty straightforward translation. The partial pattern, the input maps to an option. So that's pretty easy to, to see how that works. It's conceptually a function that takes an input, returns an option. Uh, and then the parameterized one, the parameters just get added to the, the desugaring to a function. So you know, where p here represents you know, n number of p's, the main thing is the, the order of arguments changes. So the very last input when you define your parameterized pattern, winds up being the first input to the desugared, expanded, uh, underlying mechanical function. Does that make sense? All right. So let's uh, let's move on. Let's come out of the slide deck for a minute and let's go look at some source code. Some fun real-world examples. Um, shameless plug for people who may not know: we're doing our work here in Xamarin Studio on the Mac because F Sharp is not uh, exclusively the province of Microsoft. It runs on all your major platforms, all your, you know, all your various flavors of Linux. It runs, it compiles to JavaScript. It runs pretty much everywhere. 
So what we're going to do is we're going to start with a basic program. So we're going to go through three different programs. We do a before and an after. Like what does a program look like with no active patterns? And then what does active patterns give us in the way of changing the readability of the program? So the first is a, um, is the font size okay on this? Can everyone see this all right? The first is a, a what was that? Bigger, please. Bigger, sure. Is that better? Perfect. Do this here as well. So the first program we're going to do, we'll go 36. It's going to be enormous. Uh, the first program we're going to look at is a very simple program to spit out color spaces. So we're going to take three colors, and for each color, we're going to write out the values in various color spaces. Um, are people familiar with color spaces? Basically, there are lots of different mathematical models for how you can represent the color components of an actual color. And there are different pros and cons to them. Some make more sense for working with the way monitors work. Some uh, approximate the way the human eye processes color. Some are meant to work better with video. Some are just because somebody somewhere had a, a fetish for this particular uh, you know, color space. And so what we've got here is three colors, and for each color, we list out the values in RGB, the values in HSL, and the values in HSB, which are different color spaces. That's not the interesting part. Let's go look at the code and see how we do that. So it's pretty simple. Um, we define a list of three colors that we get from the system.drawingnamespace.net. We have a simple for loop where for each color in our list of colors, we call this print color spaces function. What the print color spaces function does is it goes ahead and it takes in a system.color, or sorry, system.drawing.color. It pulls out the RGB values as floating point numbers as opposed to integral values. Uh, it calls a helper func it calls a function, uh, sorry, a method on the color instance to get the hue. It also uses the saturation and the brightness, but it converts them into floating point percentages because really that's the right way to work with these numbers. Uh, why they're integral, I have no idea. Uh, and so we've got our RGB, we've got a CTL, which we'll use to create our HSL and our HSV. And then we call this get HSV utility function, which returns us an H and S and a V. Um, we again do some scaling to get things into percentages. And then we simply print out our values, where RGB being red, green, blue, HSL being the hue, saturation, lightness, but it's actually really chroma saturation and lightness, and HSV being hue, saturation, and value. Uh, the get HSV function does some interesting math. We again take out the RGBs and, and normalize them to be between 0 and 1. We calculate the base components for our color, which are the value and the chroma. We then use the, we determine the hue and saturation based off matching against the chroma and doing some very sort of gnarly nested matching here. Uh, and then we go ahead and we divide the chroma by the value and this is how we get our hue, our saturation, and our value. Interestingly, if you have a chroma of zero, it's an achromatic and everything is gray. There's no hue or saturation. Life goes on. What we're doing in here is a bit wonky. We've got two conditionals that we match with and we check the booleans, and depending on whether these values are true or false, we do some different math. Basically, this is just a three-way match. We're saying, is R larger than B, or is, you know, basically trying to find the largest. Is R the largest, is B the largest, is G the largest? Based on which number is the largest, determines which formula we use to compute the chroma, uh, sorry, we, to compute the saturation. <laughs> and then we go ahead and we get the, the sorry, no, I said the right the first time, the hue. Yes, compute the hue this way. Sorry, compute the hue. The saturation is always chroma divided by value. So that's great. It works. It's readable. Whatever. We can make it look better. Um, so first of all, first thing we'll notice, we've got some more code here. So if you're going for a metric of least number of lines of code, active patterns not necessarily always going to be your friend. In general, active patterns, like any uh, sort of general component, their value increases the more general they become. 
So an active pattern that can only be used once from one subroutine in one very specific library, potentially worth it for the readability, but not super useful. Whereas an active pattern that can be used all over the place, very useful. For instance, uh, F-sharp supports uh, reflective metaprogramming via quotations. Uh, and the entire library is complemented by a raft of active patterns that make it very, very easy to traverse the, the, abstract, the, sorry, the abstract syntax tree generated by the quotations. So that's an example of it took them a little more thought and effort to write the, the active patterns, but the reuse on it is tremendous because it can be used all over the place. So you gotta, you gotta balance things. But what we're doing here is our print color spaces function does the same thing, it just looks a lot better. We take color and we match it inclusively against an RGB, an HSV, and an HSL. So what we're gonna see here is three different single case active patterns that provide various views into our color space. Um, for printing them out, we just convert some things into percentages and we print them out. So that's not super interesting. Um, we define an RGB active pattern, which simply takes the red, green, and blue components, converts them into floats, and now, boom, we've got our RGB partial, uh, total active pattern, our RGB view into that color. Uh, I copied this part of this algorithm from MSDN, which lists this as the HSB color space, but based on the math on Wikipedia, which is always right because Wikipedia, um, we're gonna call it HSL because the math sort of indicates that that makes more sense. What we're gonna do is from our color, we're gonna get our hue, our saturation, and our brightness, and we're gonna turn them into floats. That get brightness should really be called get lightness, but whatever, MSDN. Um, then finally, we're gonna define a multi-case total pattern that does our three-way match against our RGB for us. Now this is interesting because it's the same three-way matching to define out which is the largest number, but it's taking an active pattern as input. So what this is doing is saying, this part multi-case total active pattern takes a color as input, but I'm not even gonna work with it as a color, I'm gonna go ahead and work with it as an RGB. So I'm getting inline decomposition of my color value via an active pattern inside the definition of another active pattern. Composability all the way down. And again here, this is just again our three-way match. Is our the largest, is G the largest, is B the largest. Uh, we separate out that three state calculation from the actual math because here in the HSV total pattern, we go ahead and we take in color. We again get the RGB components from the color. So this is another example of using an active pattern for an inline decomposition. We're saying, you know what, just unpack this color as this active pattern. Give me the R, the G, and the B right away. We convert them, we, we scale them to between zero and one. We have the same calculations as before to get our value and our chroma. Um, now our hue and saturation calculations look similar but read better. Uh, our achromatic match case is still the same. Our chromatic match case, we're still getting saturation the same way, but now look at where we previously had that messy complex through a match with the actual algorithm tied into it. Here, it's very clear, we're checking the max of C. Is it R, is it G, is it B? And pulling the appropriate equation. So, cleans up the code tremendously. And then our return value, before we were returning a tuple, here we're converting that tuple into an active pattern. Uh, and just to prove that there's no hokey pokey, if I run the actual uh, updated code, it produces dun -dun 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 -dun, the same values. So before we move on to the next example, questions? All right, let's plug on. Uh, so the next example here is a little bit more fun. It's a guessing game and it's pretty straightforward. Uh, it's one of those classic, uh, you know, you get the, the color, you know, you, get, we, you pick a number and we tell you if it's the number we're thinking of kind of thing. I actually adapted this example from some of the introductory training materials for the Rust programming language which I have heard great arguments for thinking of Rust as an ML in uh, C clothing. It has many, many ML-like features, something to think about. Basically, and we're cheating here to make our lives a little bit easier, we've got a debug statement that tells us what the correct answer is because otherwise I'd be here all day guessing. But uh, so whatever, 
strings are not good and the wrong, whoa, that's not what we expected, now is it? <laughs> we could see here something is kind of wonky. Now, I mean, yes, four equals four, we'll trust that A is equal to A and that's good math, but our, our guess was supposed to be one, so what's going on here? Let's go look at this code and see what we got. Now, we've seen that there's a bug in the code. Um, this is still pretty simple code. We call a guess the number function. Uh, it just does a, basically it, it figures out what the correct number is by picking a random number. It shows us what that is for debug purposes. And then it goes into an infinite loop where it just waits for the, it gets the user input by, you know, it parses the input from the command line, does some matching to determine if it's the right answer. Take, you know, one minute here. Can anyone spot the bug in this code? That is correct. <laughs> correct. Correct is incorrect. All very correct. What this should say is n when n equals correct. But I think the idea, if we just go back for a minute to what we had, I think, you know, that's the right syntax to make this work. But I think the idea of what the author was after with this is pretty clear. The author was saying, hey, look at the answer. If the answer equals what I define correct to be, then I should be good. So, I mean, yes, the syntax is wrong, but I think the intentionality is cleaner here. Uh, the rest of the code is pretty straightforward. If it's zero, we exit. If it's within one to ten, if it's out, smaller than one or larger than ten, no good. Uh, and otherwise, we say it's not the right answer, we check correct. So, we can clean this up with active patterns to look a little bit better. Um, and so our guess the number function still looks mostly the same, but now we've done a few things to clean up our code. If we'll look back at our previous code, we're trying to parse the scanned in input. And we're going to go ahead and lift that, sorry, uh, whoops. We're gonna go ahead and lift that behind a partial active pattern. So we just have this nice clean semantics of, is this string an int? The fact that we have to do this try parse and check the values and all that stuff, not interesting. So now, just right off the bat, if nothing else, our match statement reads a lot cleaner. I mean, what reads more cleanly? Match scanf with int answer, or this crazy match int32 try parse scanf with blah, blah, blah. So simplifies that. But then we go on further. We have our match. And again, just because we can, we've replaced our when guard with something a bit uh, cleaner. Not in and a lower bound and an upper bound. Again, a partial pattern. Here, we're just taking a conditional and wrapping it in a partial pattern. And I know you're saying, Paul, big deal. You can do that with the when guard. It's not really any more code. But the when guard is something that I have to write every time I want the when guard. This is a generic reusable thing for the many, many cases where I want to make sure something is in a range. So there is some merit there. And it, it does read a little bit clearer, I think. Match answer with, you know, and then this is the last one. This is the one that really helps us not screw up. We've defined an is partial pattern. So now we can read match answer with is correct. And that's basically, yeah? It is, that's a great question. Why am I not getting IntelliSense now? Type signatures, never available when you need them. Um, <laughs> It is going to be in the library defined generically for anything that supports equality. However, uh, at the instantiation, at the call site, it's going to be restricted to being the same type. So it's going to, it's going to correctly define that n, m, and value all have to be the same type, and that type has to support equality. Um, so then, but we have our is, which our is function is very, very simple. Again, we've got a control and a test. It's going to require that they're the same type and that they implement equality, and we're just doing an equality test here. Interesting thing about this, F sharp, for those of you who have done some work in C sharp, F sharp tries to do the right thing about equals comparison. C sharp just assumes everything is reference equality. So using this, I mean, not that you can use it from C sharp because they don't support pat uh, active patterns, or at this point, pattern matching, though I hear they might get to that in like C sharp 12 or whatever. Um, <laughs> You wouldn't get the right answers anyway because fundamentally this is expecting that the equality on the type understands correctly value, structural equality versus referential equality. But I think this cleans up our semantics really well 
match answer with is correct. That's the thing we originally were trying to get at when we introduced the bug in the previous code. And just to prove that I am not a liar, Forty-four is wrong, but three is correct. Okay, so that's an example of sort of making your code more expressive, sort of cleaning things up a little bit, matching intentionality, making it a bit easier to read. Forty-four is wrong because it doesn't make not in. Well, see, you mean you want me to enter an invalid number or something that's not a not a not in the in range? Okay, so like, watch if I enter like say. Well, I mean, I entered 44 and it said it was an invalid input. So if I enter like 5, close but no cigar. So it, it understands. Zero, of course, will exit us. So moving on to our last example, and this one's going to be a little bit um, less interesting, I think, or less, no, interesting is not the right word, a little less cohesive here. But again, reflective metaprogramming in .NET is kind of abysmal because the API for it is kind of abysmal. Um, what we want to do ultimately here to start with is we want to define a function that will look at a type and tell us is that type a sequence or an option. Um, why you would want to do this, uh, this is actually a watered down version of some actual uh, fairly sophisticated reflection code that I, I wrote a few years back at an actual company I used to work for. It's been sort of sanitized and simplified but uh, there was a case where we needed to know, was this a implementation of a generic interface or was this a concrete instance of a generic type? Which is sort of ultimately what you're going for here with this. But we start simple, give me a value based on its type, is it a sequence or is it an option? Now F -sharp has this type def of construct that gives you the reflective metaprogramming type information for a particular type. In this case we'd find one for sequence and one for option. And this should work. I'm going to temporarily comment out this other code. But this should totally work. This should absolutely positively uh, for each of these different values. Actually, you know what? Screw it. We'll just run it right here in the interactive window instead of going out to the command line. Uh, no, you guys can't see that. Never mind. Forget that. We will run it on the command line. So in theory, we're going to pass it a bunch of values and it should tell us for each type whether it, if it's a sequence, it should give us the full name of the type and tell us it's a sequence. If it's an option, it should tell us the full name and tell us it's an option. Otherwise, it should give us the, the item and say we don't know what the type is. I mean, we actually do, but we're not interested. So, nope, nope that's not the right file. We want 0, 7. And you can see here, this didn't really do what we wanted because the list of numbers from 1 to 100 is very clearly a sequence and it said it didn't know what that was. In fact, it didn't know what any of these things were. Like we expected unknown for the, the, the triple and for the integer 24, but some 333.333, 333, that's actually an option. Our function should have been able to detect, hey, that's an option. So like I said, the reflection API is kind of super duper duper awful in uh, the CLR. So we have to help it along a bit. And what we have instead is this, so we had check seek or op, now we have check op or seek, which is how you're supposed to do this the quote unquote right way. Where for an item you have to get its type. You then have to do special checking for the sequence and then you have to do additional checking for the option and this just starts to get messy and confusing and the more complex cases you put on here the worse this gets. We're literally only looking at two specific cases and it's still kind of a, a nightmare. So but if we run it this time, you'll see this works better. It correctly identified our option, it correctly identified our string, and it correctly identified our list as a sequence. And that sort of makes sense, except for why is string a sequence? Now, I mean, yes, technically it's a sequence of characters, but shouldn't it tell us it's a sequence of characters? Anyway, the point is this code is not pretty and confusing, and we can clean it up with some judicious use of active patterns. First, we define a parameterized partial pattern 
for testing whether something is a concrete type or not, meaning this is actually a type, it's not some, uh, it's not either like an abstract base class or an open generic or an interface, it's an actual instantiatable concrete type that we can work with. We pass in the type we're testing for, we pass in the, uh, oh, sorry, we pass in the type we want to achieve, we pass in the type we're testing, and we have basically the same logic as before, but we've extracted out the core bits of it so that we can use this sort of generically. Um, we, then we, we then actually define another active pattern that will test whether or not something is an interface. Again, same idea, we take in the thing to parameterize by, the thing to actually test for, and we have our sort of generalized logic for testing if something is an interface. And you'll note here we use the concrete uh, active pattern as part of determining if something is an interface. Because you've got this extra layer of weirdness where something is a concrete type versus an interface, there's just extra wrinkles there. So we, we unpack that. So composability, using an active pattern inside of an active pattern. Then finally, we take our two active patterns and we partially apply them to get specific cases. So the concrete active pattern checks for if something is concrete. The interface active pattern checks if something is a, a, an interface. But we want to check for a specific concrete type and a specific interface, namely option and seek. So we partially apply them to get new active patterns. Now these are partial active patterns that are no longer parameterized because we've eaten up the parameterization by partially applying them to get an is option and an is seek. And so our actual checking code now reads much more cleanly. Like that's that we can work with. It's, it's pretty straightforward. Give me the type of some item. Is it a sequence? Yes, print its type. Is it an option? Yes, print its type. Otherwise, print unknown. And again, we can run the check against the same inputs. And you'll see we get very, very similar outputs, except that this time our second sequence is actually correctly reported as an I enumerable of character as opposed to reporting it as a string, because in .NET those are actually two different types. So again, we sort of clean up some clunky, ugly, messy APIs that are, are not even fun to work with in the language they were designed to be used from and are even uglier to use from F sharp, we clean them up. So popping back over to our slide deck. Uh, that's not what I wanted. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Hmm. Uh, OK. Is this not working? All right. Well. Our, our, our advancer stopped working, but we'll do this the hard way. So we are pretty much at time. So to recap, active patterns. Make pattern matching extensible. Bridge the gap with other abstractions. Improve the overall readability of code. And as far as I'm aware of all your, your what you would call you know, popular mainstream, uh, actually going to use it in production languages that support pattern matching. This is the only one I know of that does this, especially in this way, where I can take a very simple uh, sort of natural to the language construct and use it to make pattern matching smarter than it was. It's a compiler extensibility point is a way to think about it. Um, this is more information about me, uh, my email address. Find me on the web at whatever your favorite social thing is slash uh, The code for this talk is, I believe, up on my GitHub somewhere, and I believe I included the, uh, a copy of the paper. Uh, if not, uh, the proceedings are, are actually easy to get for free instead of being behind some ridiculous Springer-style paywall. Um, questions? Yeah, go ahead. All right, so I had two questions. The sure. first was, uh, can you put a, uh, a type signature on a pattern? Sure. Okay. You absolutely can. You can, you can give it an explicit type signature if you want to. Uh, okay. By and large, just in F Sharp, we tend to try to let the compiler infer as many things as it can, but you absolutely can give it an explicit uh, type signature if you need to. Okay. And the other thing I wanted to ask was, uh, I've, I've not heard before of people developing using F Sharp um, on OSX. Um, and I was just wondering, like, 
um, how would it, like how did you make that decision? Like how that? Uh... Uh, I have been using uh, OS uh, OS X as my my primary OS for years anyway, mm-hmm. and I had you know from the re- initial release of Mono, I had been following it. And over time, the F-Sharp support has just gotten better and better. And Z- the folks at Xamarin are actually really to credit for this. They've really made an effort to make sure that F-Sharp is a first-class citizen in the Xamarin ecosystem, which includes the Mac. It's primarily iOS and, and Android, because that's their, their real area of commercial focus. But it includes support for the Mac, so we just, we get it, for, we just, it comes from them, basically. From the work of the Mono project and also the work of Xamarin. So... Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Uh, any additional questions? I didn't know that F sharp contains a copy of Prolog. <laughs> it certainly must. Okay, because I just saw the thing with the wrong way there. You said, why didn't this work? Because you had the correct. Yes. And there's some little syntax telling you actually meant specific things. Don't, don't make the quality sign go the other way. Your quality sign is silent. Correct. Anything else? All right. All Thank right. you very much. Thank you, Paul.